This is the third talk about what a Chinese world historian looking at the last couple of thousand years or more of Western history might make of its main contours. Much of it has been going back to the various points of origin, the Greeks, the Christian legacy, and the Romans. And I would like to add to this the Anglo-Saxons. It's not perhaps very fashionable, and indeed I gather that in some universities they've banned the use of the word Anglo-Saxon, but I was brought up as a historian to believe that my own British civilization was largely originating in the Anglo-Saxon invasions which toppled the Roman Empire and that from about the 5th, 6th century, this has had a huge influence on the Anglo-sphere, as it's known, that is the British Empire, uh, America, and so on. And there are various features of the Anglo-Saxon uh, peoples, which I think to this day explain how we are as a nation. One of them is the kinship system, the family system that I now have, which traces my family back through males and females equally, and has a set of kinship terminologies which separates out the nuclear family, that is mother, father, daughter, um, son, brother, sister and then has just rings round it of cousins and nephews and nieces and uncles and aunts. That um, system, which is known as an Eskimo kinship system, uh, is Anglo-Saxon, and it hasn't changed. We added um, French terms, uncle, uh, oncle, and uh, aunt, tante, from the Norman period, but otherwise the actual concepts and ideas of inheritance and all the rest of it are Anglo-Saxon. So I am living in an Anglo-Saxon world in terms of the family. And of course for a Chinese this is very strange because there you um, have your descent through males which forms you into clans and lineages uh, and you marry out of them and you have a very restricted number of surnames, Wang and Xi and uh, Shao and so on. Um, but it's um, totally, totally different. Our system is very, as it's known technically, as egocentric. puts you in the middle and then you trace your ancestors out. And that egocentric feature could be related to something which is very characteristic of my culture, which is high individualism. Each person is complete in themselves, and each person um, thinks from the center outwards to their relatives and to the world around them. It's often, uh, in my mind, associated with Robinson Crusoe, the hero of Daniel Defoe, on his desert island. We are all Robinson Crusoe-like in not only our family system, but our economic, political, religious, and other systems. And so the individualistic family system of the Anglo-Saxons is totally different from China, and it's based uh, beyond the family. Most of your life is based on relations with non-family, with neighbors, um, and with strangers. And this uh, anthropologists describe as a system based mainly on contract, that is not written documents, but agreements with people, implicit agreements, just like you form a contract when you get onto a bus that you will behave reasonably on the bus and you'll pay your fare and so on. Not all written down. So throughout your life you have innumerable contracts and anthropologists, particularly Sir Henry Maine, has made the great distinction between societies based on status, that is on your birth, uh, which fixes you as someone in relation to someone else, a, a father, a mother, a brother, a sister, a slave or slave owner, and contract, 
and modernity is often thought of as synonymous with contractual based systems and the Anglo-Saxons very to a very large extent had contractual systems. They didn't even according to Maitland and others have communities with a cap capital C. In other words they were a very mobile, flexible, they were originally hunters and gatherers, fishermen living on the coasts uh, around Denmark and northern Germany and they didn't form into settled uh, farming communities of any kind. They hunted, gathered, moved and conquered and so there was no fixed community and to this day the idea of a strict community in the sociological sense that Tony's used meaning uh, united by blood, by place and by sentiment doesn't exist. Even the village I'm living in now is not a community in that sense. It's uh, even when I came uh, people had lived here for some time but most of them were not related to each other and they had a, only a weak form of community. Now there is no real sense of community, it's just a dormitory town but we have our cricket and football clubs and church and so on. So basically China is based largely on status, that is on your birth given position as in Confucian philosophy and it's very strongly based on uh, communities, very strong village communities and very strong clans and lineages and so that makes a great difference from our individualistic and free-flowing sort of world. Another difference, and this was noticed by Tacitus when he was comparing, he wrote a book on the Germans, Germania, and he said they are very different from the Romans in that they are a rural people. They love the countryside, they live characteristically in clearings which they've made in the woods and they hunt and they gather and they have cows and other animals and they do fishing and that is their idea of heaven, living in the countryside. Whereas we Romans, we love Rome and we love cities, we love urbanism, we are a, a city civilization and they are a rural civilization. And this difference was picked up by Karl Marx who noted it as a, a main difference. And this is true to this day. The ideal of a wealthy Englishman uh, is to go out and find, as I have, a thatched cottage with a nice garden and nice countryside round it and honeysuckle growing up the walls. That's our ideal and it's quite shocking to civilizations which believe that all of life really is and civility coming from the word for city, civis, is in the city. And um, to a large extent uh, this is not such a great difference from China because Although you have big, huge cities and so on in China, the ideal of the Mandarin certainly was when they retired to go out and live in a beautiful garden, um, maybe in the countryside, maybe in the suburbs of a, a town. But there is some yearning for the country in the same way in China. So that is not such a great difference, but it is a great difference between continental thought, even in uh, France and Italy and Spain, life goes on in the city and the countryside is where the peasants live. Um, the movement around all the time uh, of this early civilization and its constant predation and movement outward which finally led to the collapse of the Roman Empire is part of its restlessness. I live in a very restless civilization you're always clearing new land, you're always exploring new possibilities. You're not, not a rooted civilization. If you compare it with great peasantries in India or parts of China, which are bound to the land generation after generation after generation. In England, you are not bound to the land. You use it uh, and then you move on. So we were astonished when we did a study of an English village over uh, 
500 years to find that the population were constantly on the move. The idea that once upon a time, say in the Middle Ages, people were born in a place and they lived there and they died there was com shown to be completely wrong for English villages. Most people were born in one place, lived there for 10 or 12 years, then they went to another place, then they went to a third place and perhaps married, and then they went to a fourth place and then a fifth place and died. So people were fluctuating around this sm small island. Um, you get some of that in all civilizations, of course, and you find quite a lot of mobility at times in parts of China and Japan, but on the whole, they're much more rooted. And so I live in a restless civilization. And you could tie that up to a later phenomenon, that is the imperial expansion outwards of Britain, because it's extraordinary that this very small island of five or six, seven million at the time from the 16th, 17th centuries, sent so many people, a lot of them, of course, from the poorer parts like Scotland and Ireland and Wales, but also from England, and they went out to seek their fortunes all over the world. And the idea was you'd seek your fortune and then you'd bring it back and build a nice uh, stately home if you had enough. But this restlessness, always searching for something better, is of course deeply bound up also with capitalism and entrepreneurial activities. Always there's a quick bit of money to be made by doing something uh, better. Um, the Anglo-Saxons were people who had developed um, quite a good technology. They had a, a deep, strong plough to which they harnessed oxen or other animals. And they had quite a lot of cows and pigs and uh, other animals, and they fished. And so they lived off nature through using technologies. Animals are technologies, so they were very good at using animal technologies. And they basically were, as far as other people were concerned, a lazy people. They liked to produce wealth with a minimum <clears throat> of effort. So when they came to England, they soon adapted and expanded this. And by the time they'd been here for 300 years, almost every village in England had a water mill to grind the corn. They didn't want to do it themselves, and they got machines in the form of water mills to do it. And then they invented windmills, and they made a great deal of use of coal from very early on, and of wind power with their shipping, so basically the English have always tried to utilize machinery around them to minimize their effort. Whereas, um, uh, and there's been a, a long tradition of it, the evolution of technologies. Whereas in most societies, you gain your wealth, certainly in agriculture, rice agriculture in much of the world, through the input of your labor. So you work harder, and as the population grows, you don't go for efficiencies because labor is very cheap and there are lots of people needing work. You go for putting more and more intensive activity, improving your rice agriculture, uh, double cropping, triple cropping, improving the irrigation system, experimenting with seeds. And so you have what Clifford Geertz calls agricultural involution turning inwards, whereas the Anglo-Saxons onwards evolved into a sort of industrial civilization. Uh, it wasn't steam-driven, but it was um, with the division of labor and with the application of quite advanced technologies well before the Industrial Revolution. So that's a great difference between China, which is human labor-intensive, and the Anglo-Saxons, who are machine-intensive. Um, the Anglo-Saxons, basically, it was a free society. If you didn't get on with your neighbors or anyone, you just moved. You had the freedom of hunters and gatherers. And you weren't tied. They, there was some, uh, obviously, in conquest leads you to have 
uh, people who you can then uh, manipulate as slaves or um, servants. But on the whole, compared to Rome, which was based on slavery, the estates were worked by slaves, and most traditional civilizations which had extensive slavery as a class within their society. The Anglo-Saxons didn't do that. Now, there were some Anglo-Saxon slaves, but not many. And by the 12th, 13th century, there was no legal estate. The legal manuals didn't have the category of a slave. And from then on, it was a belief of the British that slavery could not exist on British soil. If, when the British did go into overseas slavery in a big way in transporting slaves or in Jamaica, if a slave came from Jamaica, then they became free when they touched English soil. They may have been bound uh, in some ways to their master, but they were technically free and they could stay and not be slaves anymore. So English air made you free. And that is quite a difference from nearly all civilizations. It's not so different from China because, again, I don't think of China as a slave civilization. Again, conquest led you to have slaves and people were sold into slavery if they were very poor and women and so on. But it's not a civilization as in Rome and elsewhere based on a vast slave workforce. So these are um, some of the differences. And although they have been talking about a thousand or twelve hundred years ago, um, as with a final difference, of course, language, I speak Anglo-Saxon, basically, um, they have continued. It's not something that just is there and then it's covered over with something else. We, England has not been conquer, conquered except by the Normans, and the Normans were Anglo-Saxons. They were Vikings, and Vikings were the same sort of people. So it was just a reinforcement of the Anglo-Saxon heritage in a different way, it's like a different language to a certain extent for a time, some added laws, but the same sort of thing. So for 12, 1500 years, um, I've lived in that kind of uh, civilization. And it's one which is adventurous, restless, aggressive, predatory, fighting, uh, as I've said it elsewhere, based on a very strong legal system, uh, quite a lot of village democracy, uh, and an advanced economic system. And that has shaped the Anglosphere. And the people who then finally ended up going to America and colonizing um, northern part of America were descendants of that sort of person. And it's a character and personality and a culture which is very different from China. And one last difference which interests me is if you look at Anglo-Saxon literature, poetry and epics and sagas like Beowulf, um, and all of this can be seen very clearly in the work of uh, J.R. Tolkien in The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit. That sort of Norse saga kind of world and poetry with um, elves maybe and uh, uh, other dwarfs and, and um, adventurous kings and the rest gave rise to a, a kind of literature and a kind of folklore which is very different from that even on continental Europe and China. Although there's, there are wizards um, in uh, Merlin, for example, in the Arthurian legends, magic in the sense that the, the landscape is infused with spirits and spirit and there is no separation between our natural physical world and a world of peopled with thousands of spirits and forces and feng shui and winds and waters and all that. That's hardly evident at all. Anglo-Saxon poetry and literature and the medieval literature is very 
down to earth and prosaic. There's nothing, not a shred of it in Chaucer, of course. Um, and so the paths had diverged, and the magical garden, as Weber calls China, is there is no magical garden here. There are magical gardens, uh, beautiful gardens, but they're not filled with forces, spirits. And so the English, in a curious way, were very Protestant. They had eliminated and pushed away much of the magic which is to be found in almost all agrarian civilizations. You find it in, obviously, in India, Mediterranean Europe, China, uh, Japan. But the Anglo-Saxons were a sort of, as it were, down-to-earth, no-nonsense kind of civilization. And that, again, is a very significant and interesting difference.